This is an interview with Elfrida, Elfrida Schragen. She's a longtime Suwood member, helper, and an artist. Can we start by asking you, how did you find and come into Subud and about what time that was? I came into Subud about 1996. And um, I live in Canada and I, I took my summers down in Mexico and I hooked, you know, connected up with a cello player down there who uh, I played the cello and I went down there and he was to give me lessons. And um, we needed some uh, adjustments to the bow of the cello. So he took me to Carretero, where I met a man called Lufty Becker. And Lufty Becker ran a school for instrument making. I think it was in Carretero. I don't know exactly. But anyways, we talked about many things. And Lufty took me back to his home. And I met his wife. And I, I, at that time, I, I thought he everything was very quiet. The next summer, I came back down. The cello player had uh, gotten AIDS, and he, while I was there, he died. And I thought to myself that I really should go and let Lufty know, because I didn't think there was any way to know. So when I was there, Lufty said to me, so what are you doing down here now? And I said, I explained a couple of um, things that I'd done with three different women who had had a crisis in their life and they all had neck problems so I did a little art therapy with them and Lufty said to me oh so do you think you're a healer and I said no 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 nothing so uh, flaky as that I'm just happened to work with them and <clears throat> Lufty said well you know I belong to a group where you could test something like that and then I I just was interested and I started got really intensely interested and he talked for about 10 minutes and suddenly he stopped and said, I shouldn't be telling you all this. There wouldn't be a place in Victoria that has a uh, Subud. And besides, you should be talking to a woman about this, not me. And he was quite upset. And I said, it's okay, Lufty. I, I don't even remember what you said, but that wasn't true. I was very interested and I just kind of perked up inside. And when I came back to Canada, I opened the telephone book and honest to God, I opened it right where Subud was advertised. <laughs> that was the beginning. So I saw Lufty again many years later, probably 20 years later, 25, and reminded him. Of course, he didn't remember, but that's how I came in. <laughs> and how was it? Uh, were you doing like a probationary period and sitting outside or? Oh, um, um, no, actually, I'm, I didn't believe in God. And I had a lot of negative feelings about the word and what that had done and Christianity and any any organized religion. So that's what perked me up about Subud was the fact that it wasn't depend, you could do it without being dependent on a organized religion. So uh, when I went to the helpers in Victoria, I, probably one of the first things I said to my helper was, well, yeah, I'll come and meet with you every week, but I don't want to any God talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly enough, we met in her hot tub for, you know, my probationary period. <laughs> okay. And how was it when you were open? Did you feel something? Um, it, you know, to be honest, it's hard to tell. I'm, uh, I have a great imagination. At that time, I just kind of let things fly and I just had a good time. <laughs> I don't know whether it was receiving or acting out. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So I assume it progressed and you eventually felt something stronger or well i um i was in subud for about a year and a half and then the last year i was starting to get diverted by other things and i was um my mind wasn't into subud very much and by that time i was highly questioning whether i was actually receiving anything and i went with a friend down to mexico again good old mexico 
And when I was down there, it happened to be that the World Congress was at Spokane. Now, the members had talked to me about it, but I didn't even, I couldn't even imagine what they were talking about. But after a week in Mexico, I suddenly said to my friend, I'm sorry, I have to leave. I have to go back to Spokane. And, and I have to get in on this Congress, even if they don't have a place for me. It was very, very strong. And um, I came back and I met my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so isn't that amazing? I mean, yeah. literally, he also came for the second week of the Congress and I arrived for the second week. He had just retired. And so he was available. I still had a couple more years of teaching to do. He happened to be available and, and you know, until he died, we were, we were together for 27 years. So it was pretty oh. special, pretty special. And actually that's, uh, Subud has meant a lot to me in, as I gain trust, I do receive things, but not so much even in the laddie hand, but I'll receive strong notions to do something. And when I do, well, in even buying a house, going and look at looking at many houses or many situations, and I didn't have to write and question. I would just say, "Well, this isn't. It doesn't feel right. Doesn't feel right." And then, bingo! This is it. This is it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's a form of receiving. Yeah, yeah, and and I I I think probably what the laddie hen has given me is to uh, a sensitivity and to um, not question so much as it's just opened me more up to the sensitivity of the vibrations in around and that sense of we're all one. It's been really excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, I do remember when my husband met me and, and he heard that I was an artist. He said, so, so do you feel the laddie hand when you're painting and stuff? I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I have an image and I start to paint and then the image, I start interacting with what I've painted. So the image doesn't become the end result. I'm, I'll put down a color and I, I like that and something matches with that. And so my original idea was just the starting point. So Perhaps that's a receiving. I I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when did you start doing your artwork? My my I was raised in a home. My father was a professional artist, and um I wanted to please daddy for sure. So I drew a lot. And then when I was about 10 or 11, unfortunately, my daddy took it upon himself to begin to teach me and he started to mess with my art so i basically stopped doing it and went on to work as a work with children i became a teacher i worked with emotionally disturbed children first and then i went on and got my teaching degree and then worked again with disturbed children and a long pro program organized around autism and um and then eventually got to regular mm -hmm. kids. And when I hit my 40s, I had kind of a midlife crisis. I don't know what I'm doing. Why should I be doing this? I thought I would then become an art therapist. And the woman in charge of the program said, oh, yes, you'd be good. But I want you to take a couple of classes, a drawing class and a painting class or a life. Draw I can't remember what it was. But once I started, I thought, this is such fun. This is I don't want to do therapy with this. I'm having such a good time myself that I want this for myself. Hmm. So then that's when I started painting. And I, actually, I did a lot of pastels. And I did a lot of clay work, too. And some of my work was quite uh, erotic. And oh. when I met Hamilton, <laughs> I took him to show him some of my art in the in the gallery that was set up in Spokane. And um, I could tell he wasn't pleased. This is a man I didn't even know at this time. Uh, I could tell he wasn't pleased, but he never said anything. But he didn't say anything positive either about my work. So eventually got married and I stopped doing the erotic art and got into more uh, 
process art. I don't know if that means anything to you, but processes. Say that one more time. Process art. So it, it it's art that, for me, I don't know how other people, it's not a term I've heard used by other people, but I use that term process. So whatever process I'm in, in my self-development, in my self-growth, I um, often will have images about it and paint that. And then after I met, met Hamilton, I just really worked very hard on portraits and landscapes, much more concrete, and um, did... Actually, this is a Subid story. I, in 2007, I did uh, Ramadan. Mm -hmm. It was very hard on me. But when we were done, about the, the very day we were done, I received a, a strong sense that I needed to paint portraits of people without homes, street people. And um, because I thought, well, you know, you've had other ideas before, you don't follow through. I, I went out and met a couple of people and I painted a couple of portraits. And then I said, yeah, this is, I can feel this is going to work for me. So I went to a, what we call a street minister, Rev Al. And um, he was in the process of getting a lot of money, which he eventually did. He procured $18 million to build a facility for the homeless people. And I told him what I was doing. He got really excited, was incredibly supportive, gave me waivers and various things. And I did a project for them. So, and that was, that felt, you know, when you make the right decision, things just don't go wrong. Mm -hmm. That Well, that was so consuming. And every time I moved, I didn't have doubts about, about what I was doing. It felt so right. And, um, so I did, we made a, you know, a, some of my friends were so excited about what they were, I was doing. They said, how can we help? And I said, well, you can sell these. And then all that money went to the, um, to the ho homeless uh, mm -hmm. establishment. And um, we made, I think about $24,000 on that first thing. And then, um, I did another one, and only this time it was of women my age in Victoria who'd made a, a significant contribution to the community, and we're all graying and, you know, fading off into the distance, so I thought they should be recorded, so I did another one, and we made a lot of money on that, because the women knew how to sell themselves, their families wanted the portrait, and so I think I I think I did 45 paintings that time. And again, once I was on that track, I was just pouring paintings out and I was getting better too, which was exciting, you know, the more you do it. And I had all these wonderful models all the time and got to know a lot of people and, and, and got to know a lot more about the indigenous population here too. Um, that was more in the first one. Mm. And then I, then I did a third project again, with that same power. And this was young people who are advocates and addressing issues in the environment. Um, and that didn't make so much money because the young, young people were shy <laughs> and they didn't uh, know how to push it with their families and stuff. So, but, but altogether, I think when we put everything together, we made uh, all those three series, we made about $90,000, which was really, you know, a happy thing to do. And it all went to our place. Um, and I, I do think at that time, Subud had uh, that quiet mm -hmm. energy there for me. So has, has uh, being in Subud affected the way your art has progressed? That, that's hard to say. Um, since Hamilton's died, my art's taken another turn. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm right now back to more, a little bit more of what I would call process art, which I get images that aren't a, of a typical nature and they're very much associated somehow with what I'm feeling. And certainly um, that, you know, involves grieving and adjusting to a, being a single person and um, grow, you know, it, it, it's rich. It's rich. It's a rich time.
Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps, see what did, yeah. So is there a place online that someone can find your art? Uh, sure. It's, um, it, I have a website and it's www.elfridasart.com. And so that's, I'll spell Elfrida, E-L-F as in Fred, R-I-D as in David, A-S as in Sam, C-H-R-A-G-E-N.com. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm Thank on you Facebook too. <laughs> oh, okay. That's good. Uh, have you had any kind of unusual spiritual experiences that you could share? Well, nothing comes to mind. I think I would call those spiritual experiences, what I explained to you, that kind of, that feeling when you are on the right path. To me, that is a spiritual experience, the, the energy, the vibrations. Also, I have um, just recently come to be able to more comfortably use the word God. And it's more about, you know, somehow it has something more to do. I'm not sure, I'm still defining it, but it, I, I'm i okay with the word now. And I, I recognize that God is in everybody and everything. So he ceases to be the white man, you know, the man in the sky with the halo, et cetera. So it's now, it's more like a, I'm, I recognize it as a vibration mm -hmm. and that that we can at times really experience that vibration. And um, so I get, that's a spiritual experience, I guess, just coming to that and um, knowing that, you know, when I'm very still and quiet inside, I can feel the vibration. I can feel uh, part of the fabric of of humanity i can feel and i yeah i i think that's it's not like i'm you know things come out of the sky i i don't have any weird and far out things but yeah i mean i wish i would it sounds fun <laughs> but i i i feel you know i it definitely has benefited me and i've grown a lot since i've been in super so you said you were married for 27, 28 years? Yeah, it, it was a, a second marriage. I, I had been married 22 years before that, uh, you know, for 22 years before that. And had two. I have two children. Well, they're hardly children. <laughs> Adult children. <laughs> and so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I said, and two grandsons. So. Oh, okay. Good. I'm very fortunate. <laughs> so when your husband passed away... Was that fairly recently? Yes, he he passed away this March, so eight months ago. Wow. He had been in two thousand and seventeen. He had a stroke, but it didn't. Um, I mean, of course, it affected him in every way. But he was certainly after a while. He had full use of his hands and talking and um, everything, except he never could walk again. So he was in a wheelchair. Mm. Yeah. It was a challenging time. You know, you wonder if you'll manage through those challenging times, but I did experience, you know, when you really love somebody, it's not a question. You just do. You yeah. get you get on with it and do what you have to do. Yeah. And how was it for you when he passed? It was um uh, I I wasn't it wasn't shocking in the way that I was so surprised. He he had been on and off increasingly sick, and but each time he, he went to the hospital, I was thinking, well, is this it? Or and then he would rise again, and so I was just shocked because I wasn't expecting it at that particular time, and then I was holding him when he died, and I think that was the very biggest shock because it. He just wasn't there anymore. Mm. And he it was in my arms, and then he wasn't there. Yeah. And it's a 
nothing like I'd ever experienced before. And then I can remember a month or maybe six weeks later, it hit me that he wasn't ever coming back. That, And that was, again, a shock. Because when mm -hmm. someone dies, it's, it, they're, they're kind of there anyway. Yeah. yeah. Have you been through that? <laughs> um, well, my, my father died uh, in 2016. Uh-huh. And, uh, but I, I didn't really feel anything unusual at that point. There wasn't like a disappointment or anything. It was just like he's went on to the next life. So, yeah. yeah, I think with Hamilton, because we were so close and we were so tuned into each other's feelings, I, I, I wailed, you know, I, I understood some of the when you see people in, in other countries, how they wail, I wailed. And it, it wasn't anything I could control. It just w was a wailing. And it didn't last all that long. But it took me a while to get the image out of my mind mm -hmm. and to begin to remember him and I now still very much kind of experience him in a vibrational way in my body. Just, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. He was a great guy, by the way. He was a national, he was an international helper for a while. And that was, he said, the best experience in his life. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. They gave him purpose. Anything more you'd like to share about? Anything you've experienced in Suwood or? Um, well, I certainly have had to let a lot of self-image go and be who I am rather than trying to prop it up. Um, I, I, I'm grateful for that. I thank Suwood for that. Um, yeah, I have had humiliating, humbling experiences. <laughs> One of the best experiences that I have, I think, is when we test. And um, you you might feel that, oh, well, I, at that time, I was very judgmental. I don't feel it. But I would say, well, that person really doesn't know what they're talking about. Or this person, this is... Uh, and then I began to feel that actually when you test with two or three people, that everybody has something to add, no matter whether you like it or not, and that it's part of and important. And so the separation between you and that person, you you feel your dependence, interdependence. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of a wonderful feeling to feel that everybody matters. Yeah. Everybody has something to contribute, even if in the past you've thought that they hadn't. They do in their own way. And it may not be a way that you're comfortable with, but they have something there. And again, it, it fills in that feeling of being that we're all kind of connected. Yeah. We have a lot to offer each other. Yeah. yeah. I can't think of anything else, Rockman. I, I don't know. You have to trigger my mind or something. <laughs> well, would you recommend Subu to other people? Very, uh, very cautiously. I would, um, I find that to me, it's been such a deep experience. I don't have words to explain a lot of it. Um, and, you know, you have a feeling about whether someone's going to be interested and follow up on it. Mm -hmm. And often I'm dealing with my own doubts. So that makes it more difficult to recommend. Would I recommend? Yes. If you're interested, man, go for it. You know, you, it, 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 you, once you decide and you make the commitment, there is a huge, great deal to be gained. Yeah. 
So you were opened in, in 1994, is that correct? I think 1996 or 95. And then 95. I met Hamilton in 97. Oh, and, and I was going to say meeting Hamilton, absolutely. Whenever I had my doubts, he was there and there, he had no doubts. So he actually kept me in Subud by that, the way he was. Because I think he, you know, he had talked to Bapak a little bit and had met him and he was right there kind of in the beginning. He went to the, I think they had a Bali World Congress and he was there for that. So he had a lot of that juice, the juju. <laughs> so have you been to many of the World Congresses? Um. Yes. Uh. Well... I was at the one in Bali, for sure, uh, New Zealand, Puebla, Spokane. Am I missing one? I think that's it. I didn't go to the ones in Germany. Yeah, that, it's wonderful. <laughs> do, do any experiences from the Congresses stand out to you? Um, yeah, not great ones. Hamilton was pretty six, he was having trouble. And I remember in Puebla, we left a few days, even though he was an international helper at that time, we left a little bit early because he was having trouble breathing. So I was worried a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But the other ones were pretty great. Yeah. New mm -hmm. Zealand was pretty great. Yeah. It's a fun way to see the world. Say that one last thing again. It's a fun way to see the world. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was I went to the Congresses starting in 1967. Wow. In Tokyo. And I went to all the Congresses since then, except the last one, the one in in uh Kalimantan. Right. So Hamilton and I lived a year, almost a year in Bali. And I knew that if I went to Kalimantan, I would not survive. <laughs> <laughs> the heat uh, it would just, you know, I'd probably stand up uh, from bed and fall back down again. It was, it was pretty, yeah. Weird. yeah. We're getting too old for that. Yeah, I... I received not to go for to that one. <laughs> I think it was a good decision. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Because a number of people did get sick. Yeah. I, my friend Rohana ended up in hospital. So. Oh, that's the other thing. I, I have made some, met some wonderful people in Subud. And, and uh, yeah, long time continued friends. And I mean, what a gift to be friends with people all over the world. Mm -hmm. And that's been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have any more questions, but if you have anything else you'd like to add, it's up to you. Well, no, it's good. Thank you for asking me if I would do this. And I'm not sure what do you do with this now, Rockman? What yeah. do I'm going to go ahead and stop it, but we can talk a little bit afterwards. Sure. So okay. Stop sure. the recording. If I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> Is, I'm going to probably have to, uh, oh, wait a minute, here we go. Recording. No. It's not giving me an option to stop. It should give you an option to stop recording for sure. I might have to just end the thing and call you up on the phone or something. <laughs> well, you know what? You could just text me. I'm just curious about what's going to happen and where, where, you know, I could, people could look for it or. Yeah. Um, you can just you, text me all that or. I put them on the Subud uh, archives. Okay. And. I usually put them on YouTube also, but that's up to you if you want to. 
I, I don't mind at all. Um, I'm just wondering, um, what would you look up on? I'd say YouTube, Elfrida Schragen, something like that, or what would you do? Uh, it's, I'll put them in something called Subud Stories and Experiences. And okay. there's a bunch of other ones there too. And okay. uh, I will send you a link just as soon as it processes. Okay, thank you. That's good. Well, it's nice to kind of talk with you and I hope I didn't, you know, I hope I was appropriate. <laughs> thank you. It was very good. Very nice to hear your story. Okay, okay. Just say good night. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.